Three people on a couch, back here with another episode. Today we have a very special guest, Dr. Barbara Rubin. She's a clinical psychologist. She was a studio teacher. She's a Reiki and meditation healer. And now she's an actor in Los Angeles. You might've seen her in some of the biggest national campaigns, Facebook, MedMen. She pops up in music videos and films too. Barbara, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Of course. Always a pleasure. And we are so happy to have you here. Like. I got so excited when they said that you were going to come on because you know Barbara since before, but I don't. And I have so many questions. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I'll try to answer them. <laughs> um, so you've clearly you have a, quite a, a resume of different jobs that you've done over the years and some accomplishments as well. This um, is sort of my second act. It, what, what is? Being in commercials and acting. Well, I want to talk about it because obviously I'm an actor and... Steven was telling me before we were shooting that you did one of the biggest ads. What was that for? That was for Facebook or the fa- the the uh, voting commercial for voting. Ah, uh-huh. where I was in the beginning, in the middle, and the end. At the end, you'll probably remember I said, "So don't forget, get out there and vote." It's very <laughs> no, I I remember the exact line because I heard this commercial. No lie, probably ten times a day on yeah. across multiple channels. The Absolutely. line was, "Get out there and vote. It's so important." <laughs> <laughs> you did a Boston accent. There was there was a little there was <laughs> looking for an accent, but my kids kept calling me and saying it's very important. <laughs> there is definitely a Boston affect to it. I remember whether it was CNN, ESPN, ABC, MTV. This ad aired more than any other ad. It was, it was on a, TV as well. Yes, it was airing oh. on TV. It was a, election season. You so know, it was TV and it was on social media. If only I got residuals. Uh, you know how ele- election is always a media frenzy. So they played that commercial more than anything. About I've, eight I've times seen. a day in most states of the country. Everybody saw it. Was that uh, one of the largest things you've done acting wise? Well, that was the most broadcast, I mm-hmm. would say. Because you were also, um, if I recall, you're in uh, one of the One Direction uh, one of the guys from One Direction's music videos that has over Neil 20, Horan, yes. yes, that has over twenty million views on it. Yeah, that was so much fun. It was like they were paying me to have fun, and he was letting me star in his video. <laughs> How uh, was he as like a person? Was he nice? Was oh yeah, nice guy. Yeah, pleasure to be with him. So he let me be in every scene. Yeah, you're you're in it. What was the video called again? No, no, no judgment. No, no judgment. Was the name of the song. And was the other guy who's in the video? Did you know him before? Did you no. know that? No, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> so why don't you take us back to a little bit of the beginning of your story when you first moved to L.A. because you were a studio teacher. You were teaching and counseling for other actors. Was there a... When I first moved to L.A., I was just teaching in the public schools. Okay. And then a friend, some friends of mine said, you should, uh, you should do some background work and see how movies are made because you've never seen that before and it's fun. So... My husband and I did that for a while, and pretty soon that's all I was doing, and then I became a studio teacher because I was a licensed teacher, and I needed one further license to do it in L.A., so I got that, Mm -hmm. and then I went on lots of TV shows, and... um, what does that mean? So studio teacher, that means... That means that if anybody's under 18, mm-hmm. you have to have a licensed studio teacher to be there to make sure you don't get hungry, cold, tired, molested, nothing bad <laughs> happens. <laughs> nothing bad happens to you. A little bit of a jump between those first two <laughs> to the next. Um, you know, the, the, you don't, there were no accidents and mm. you don't get cold. You have to eat on time and you can only work a certain number of hours depending on the age you are. Gotcha. When did you, do you still do that now or? No, I gave that up a couple of years ago. Okay. Um, and when did you get into commercial acting? Was that more recently or you do, have you been doing that for years? That was more, that was after I retired from counseling and psychology and in studio teaching. Uh, I was looking for a fun class to take, mm-hmm. and somebody said, you'll like this class. They do um, improv, and they do on-screen on s- commercial acting, and it's just for the fun of it. And I so I did. I tried it, and for sure, it was a lot of fun. And the next thing I knew, I had an agent, and I had a job, <laughs> and I was acting. It just happened. There's a lot of different stories on how to make it in Hollywood. That's a definitely a unique just one. happened. It was not a plan. Hmm. When you were growing up and watching movies and seeing the big Hollywood stars, were you you were attracted to LA for 
No. You just <laughs> you just wanted to go have a complete opposite experience. I was experience. married to a surfer, and he wanted to come here and surf. Mm. So he kind of dragged and, you out and, of here. And I was I had been accepted to the University of Southern California to get a doctorate. Mm-hmm. Is that where you went? Yeah, that's oh. where I got my doctorate. USC. Yep. Oh. Um, Amanda, I know you have a ton of questions, and we're like stealing it away. I can see you're like about to ask it. I mean, I jump in. No, 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 no. I, I just, I'm just listening, and I just love these kind of stories because, as of me being in LA, it feels like everyone moved to LA to become an actor and have these big dreams, and then it's Barbara here that just like. Yeah, and then I became an actor. And I love that because I have no idea what I want to do with my life. <laughs> and it just feels reassuring that it might happen someday, some some way, you know? You might just fall into it like I did. Just yeah. Just fell into it. Yeah, and even if I don't think it's going to be acting because, you know, I don't have any acting or... or yeah, I don't know if that's true. You did pretty what good in a short film. What else are you drawn to? I'm drawn to a lot of things, but the thing is, so I'm from Sweden originally. I moved here two years oh, ago. I can see that. <laughs> Blonde and the blue eyes. Mm. Um, so I moved here just because of the weather, honestly. You know, that's a really good reason to be here. Yeah. I think we have the best weather on this planet. Oh. I do. I really think so, too. Yep. yep. And so I just moved here for the weather, and... So, yeah. But you're almost in a great situation because you don't have that uh, pressure putting on yourself. Like, I just moved here to make this happen, make this career in show business work. So you have no expectations. So you can go into these different ventures in like the podcast. For yeah, example. like doing a podcast or, yeah. You're doing a podcast? Yeah, I am. Actually. <laughs> There's a camera? Well, right, right, right now. <laughs> one thing all the, all the acting coaches tell you is, you can't care one way or the other whether you get the part. You have to be really confident that if they don't pick you, they're having a tr- problem with discernment. And I believe that. I like that. I really like that. And, you know, so you can't care. So you can't be upset. You can't be disappointed. You can't get discouraged. You just have to have fun with it. Just have fun doing whatever you're doing. I like that. I really like that. And that's kind of what I'm trying to do, too. Because sometimes I do feel a little bit lost, like, which way am I supposed to go? Because in Sweden, I had this super path. I had a great career within IT oh. and just working corporate jobs. And I, you know, I bought my house and I was, you know, everything that was missing was really the guy and the kids and the dog. And I was like, no, nope, I don't want to do that. And I'm going to move to L.A. and become broke and <laughs> not knowing what I'm going to do dog? with my life. I don't have a dog. Aww. Did you move here by yourself? I did. Ah, how brave of you. Yeah, I, some people might say. How long have you been here? Two two years. And do you love it? I love it. Okay. I do. Good. It was the first year was obviously the pandemic happening here. So it was very confusing for all of us. Yeah. But I learned to love LA even during a global pandemic. <laughs> I loved it immediately. I grew up in the midst of a big city, but raised my kids in a small town, which I loved yeah. because I was an only child and didn't really have any relatives, and the whole town became my family. It was just super. And and my kids could go out and play, and nobody thought about anything bad happening to them, and it was make sure you're home by the time the street lights go on, and that's how it was for everybody. We didn't lock the doors. We left the keys in the ignition so we'd know where they were. Yeah. <laughs> just that that is my childhood because i also grew up in a small town outside yeah, of stockholm know. yeah so i know exactly that nothing was ever locked did you lock your doors yes no i feel like <laughs> growing up as a kid like it wasn't that important to lock your doors it wasn't kids in boston going, yeah and it's hey, I'm walking small, here in a small town in a small town i remember Far like, from boston all the yeah. 40 minutes a lot of <laughs> kids would be out playing and then all night, and then my dad would like just make this noise that, <laughs> like, really, hey, it's time to run home and go to dinner. Yeah, you hear it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Or my mother would call me out the window. Barbara. Yeah. I don't know why I have a British accent. With her Yiddish <laughs> accent. I would. Barbara, come here. It's dinner yeah. time. Just Barbara. <laughs> so. So Barbara has a very uh, spiritually inclined outlook on things. Would you say? that uh, bl- blossomed from having your background in psychology mixed with the funky California way of life? How do you see that, how that unfolded? 
be interested in meditation and Reiki and exploring all those different... Well, you know, I was one of those flower children that lived through the 70s and did plenty of LSD and met Ram Dass when he was still Richard Alpert. Before he was Ram Dass? Uh Uh-huh. He was a teacher at Harvard right? with Timothy Leary and another friend named Harrison. Where did you uh, meet him? At Harvard? My friends were among the some of the people who did the psilocybin experiments with them for which they were later expelled from Harvard. And so when you, did you do psilocybin with uh, Richard Albert? No. Okay. What about my, Tim? my best friend did and her husband. How, uh, how was that, that experience for them? Did you, like, I'm sure they talked about it. Oh, and- yeah. Well, I ended up doing lots of LSD too <laughs> with them, without them. How was, how was that your first time you did LSD? Oh... Uh, I had the true mystic experience that people meditate in caves for 20 years to get. Wow. Yeah, it was a third of an Osley blue flat, because I'm a lightweight, and my boyfriend at the time who gave it to me knew that I didn't need a whole one. So he gave me a third, and he he went someplace, maybe to the bathroom. Anyway, he was gone just long enough for me to do my own thing. And I was sitting in the middle of the bed in a meditative position, and I left my body behind, and I saw the light, and I went into the light, and I saw that all of life was like a s- pinwheel spokes with a center, and all the spokes were made of English languages, science, math, mechanical engineering, I mean, just everything mm-hmm. all led to the same center. And in the center, which is, was God, which is love. It was perfect. I got it all just there. I and didn't ever have to do it again to understand everything that we we're able to understand. So when this when this happened for you, you were by yourself. Your boyfriend had gone away. Well, he went into the other room. And how long did this take? This was over a few minutes or a few hours? It's hard to say when you're tripping. <laughs> it's really, you know, time doesn't sure. exist. You know, it's interesting because like psilocybin um, has been in clinical research now they brought it back i think a couple years ago and it just got federal grant money uh last month five million at um um what's the college uh john Hopkins. yes john hopkins university got a grant for five uh five million to do research mainly with ptsd depression and nicotine addiction and in germany and england for years and years they've been using lsd and psilocybin Hmm. to treat alcoholism and all those things you just named. Why do you think it took the U.S. so long to catch on? Well, it was considered, remember, it was considered a class one drug because they thought we were going to overthrow the government Hmm. and they were frightened. And so that's why people were afraid of it. People with the money were afraid of it, so they shied away. Makes sense. Hmm. Did you ever, have you done LSD, Amanda? No. No. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry but it's something about when barbara is speaking i don't know if you guys you feel this trance. but i just like i don't know i just get so calm and relaxed. i just want to yeah i feel so relaxed and i just want you to to tell your stories forever <laughs> so this is okay. the closest to lsd i've come so far yeah when she was describing like i almost viewed it like the petals of a flower oh yeah i was, I was just, like i could feel it how that I is. know I was there. <laughs> it felt like I was there with Barbara, right? Yeah, the exactly. spokes of a oh. wheel. The spokes are more like the spokes of a wheel. So, like if you you know a dartboard. Mm-hmm. Well, and each one has one of those practices on it. When I, sorry, when I had uh, my first office job in Los Angeles, I was so unhappy and disconnected from it that I think I actually triggered an ego death within myself because I didn't want to be there so badly. And I remember having the imagery, which I just thought of from your uh, spokes on a wheel analogy. I had the imagery of the symbolism of that we're not a object, we're a process. We're like part of a process. We're not these separate uh, objects. We're all part of like a bigger process. And I really felt that within me while I was sitting at my cubicle in El Segundo for an accounting and tax and audit consulting firm. But that's a little bit interesting that you say that because I, you, you know this, but I had a job, a corporate job here in LA 
And I'm used to corporate jobs. I've been working, you know, corporately for over 10 years. But when I got here, it's something about the sun that just made me realize that what am I doing with my life? I don't want to be in a cube or an office job ever again. Mm. And I just need to, just like Barbara said, I just need to have fun. I just need to live and like really experience life in the best way possible. And that's why I quit my job for the record. But but it's so funny that LA or something like that can can make you think yeah, it's so like differently. When you go into the, the darkness far enough, once you finally let go, you can get much further in terms of enlightening thoughts and epiphanies. Once I, you finally like springboard back into the light. I feel like I had a similar experience when I was on mushrooms. Really? <laughs> well, that, that is still a side. Did you know? I don't know if I had an ego death. It's hard to say. Like I lost a sense of like I lost this uh sense of like Brian and Brian's problems and all that stuff and sort of went into like the bigger picture of things. And I from what I understand that is sort of what an ego death is. Right. But it wasn't in the sense like a, um it wasn't scary. It wasn't, I wasn't, initially when I, when I did mushrooms, I did it in August for the first time. And, um, initially when it started like kicking in, I started kind of tossing and turning. I was like, I don't want to do this. What am I doing? Like, how do I get out? Where's the, you know, where's the abort button? And everyone told me, you just, you have to surrender. You have to breathe into it. And I was like, well, I just flew all the way here to do it. I hired a guide, like, you know what? Like just breathe in. And so I took that breath in and then I exhaled and it was like, I was floating on a magic carpet. And just traveling through like the space time <laughs> continuum, and I was blindfolded for this, so I, I mimicked what John Hopkins does in their clinical research. So I was blindfolded. I uh, did about four grams of mushrooms, and I was laying in a bed with music going, and it was bliss. Did you get to choose your own music? I didn't. No. What kind of music was it? Uh, it was sort of like um, ambient vocal tribal. Amazon rainforest. Oh, it sounds he- heavenly. Yeah, esque. It was like, and we also listened to. Uh, I'll be coming out with an album. Uh, we also, <laughs> we also listened. Um, so John Hopkins has their own playlist that they use for the trials. You can actually find it on Spotify. Really? So it, yeah, it starts off with like classical music, and then it's designed to go like the rhythm of the music and the tones to go with the peak. So as you're peaking on the psilocybin the music peaks with you. So the whole playlist is designed to guide you on that journey. Have you ever heard of the Schumann resonance? So a lot of classical music, Beethoven, classical composers, they actually made a lot of their music based on the Schumann resonance, which is some of the vibrations, natural vibrations of the earth. Are you saying resonance or residence? Resonance. Okay. Oh, something said residence. Yeah. <laughs> you know I'm Schumann. Here. Get over here. You know Schumann down on <laughs> Robertson. And there's also something I used to listen to in college called binaural beats. So you can. Oh, yeah. So you've heard those. There's different ones. It's like one's called LSD, one's called mushrooms, and the binaural beats. It just sounds like shh, but it's different pitches and tones, and you listen to it. And it's supposed to mimic some of the experience you get on those particular really? hallucinogens. Have yeah. you? Um, so you mentioned, did you do a meditation retreat with Ramdas? I did. I in Brighton Bush, Oregon, with a tribe of hippies who cooked the most delicious vegetarian food. What year was this? Nineteen ninety-three August. So this was before he had a stroke. Oh, way before. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He and my then husband were writing letters to each other when people used to write longhand letters to each other. I've heard of those things. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And um, he invited him to come and bring me and go to this retreat in the woods of Brighton Bush and live in a tent for a week and listen to him speak and eat the delicious food and just relax and maybe learn something. And when the time came to go, he's an electrical um, engineer and he got a big job and he had to hire new guys and he just couldn't leave. He had to be there to supervise. So he said to me, but but it's all planned and there's a spot for us. Why don't you just go? Oh, So, so I did. <laughs> so I did. And there I was in the middle of the woods with a flashlight with no electricity and no bathroom. And I had to go find one if I needed one in the middle of the night. And I sat at the feet of Ram Dass for four hours a day and just hung on his every word and listened to everything that he had to say and was surrounded by people who were doing the same thing. 
Was Timothy Leary there as well, or were they no. not? They were kind of separated by that point. Oh, they were well separated yeah. by then. Timothy was in jail and out. And right. Do you, Amanda, are you familiar with who Ram Dass is? No. So um, Ram Dass and Timothy Leary are like considered like the grandfathers of LSD and psilocybin and like the whole revolutionary, the psychedelic movement uh, in the 70s. Um, they were both professors at Harvard. Uh, so Ram Dass, whose actual name is Richard Albert, um, and Timothy Leary were both professors at Harvard. Albert. Richard Albert, um, doing these clinical trials and testing drugs on students and stuff. And then people flipped out. And I believe um, Richard got fired first and then Timothy left, I think. They, they, no, they were both asked to leave. They're both asked. Mm -hmm. um, and then they went to, I guess, a commune. And my other friend Harrison, who worked with them as a professor and was involved in this. He also left. Yeah, he left. I mean, he was asked to leave. <laughs> <laughs> These were tenured professors, so it was yeah. a big deal. And um, I guess, so who else? And then, what did they go after they left? They, I believe they went to a commune or something. Well, yeah. Um, Timothy Leary found this mill, millstone, Milford, up in New York. Right, right, right. A huge estate donated to him by the heiress that whose name I can't think of. You know, one of uh -huh. those heiresses from some serial fortune or something. And he just lived there for years, and people came and dropped LSD with them and had a wonderful time until he went on from there. Yeah, I think he was going to Mexico, and he had weed, and he got arrested. And then he went to jail, I want to say, for two years? Is and that right? And then he hired my friend Bruce to get him out. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. How did that go down? Like, how did that... Just got him off. <laughs> <laughs> was he in jail for two years? I don't know exactly how long. That's crazy. Can you imagine something that's legal now yeah. in America? So, yeah, and Bruce actually, correct me if I'm wrong, Barbara, played a integral role in the legalization of marijuana in oh, California. Absolutely. Really? He, he was a key man. Yeah. He, he was the one who started NORML, N-O-R-M-L, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Law. And he was key to getting it all made legal. Wow. And he's still the president of the L.A. chapter. And he just came back from uh, San Francisco where they had a big organization and presentation about it. And it was in all the papers. Huh. So when you're um, – after this retreat, when was it that you met? Because I believe you said you'd met um, uh, um, Deepak Chopra at some point. Oh, yeah. I went to some uh, – I went to a, um, a week-long retreat with him down in san diego that was very interesting i met osho while i was there you met osho osho was there wow wait what year was this isn't the book that right behind seven, me? It is, the book is behind you yeah a people osho book uh, over there um it must have been when did he come i don't remember 80s it was, 70s it, no no this was in the early 2000s osho in the two, early 2000s when i went to san diego with deepak it was the early 2000s when did when did all that go down with Osho and um and um there was a, I watched the show on Netflix. Uh, I, he, I didn't see it. He came out here and then he was with that woman and then she tried to poison all these like people like the oh, mayors. The, I I didn't know anything about that. Oh, what was it? So Osho was this um. Well, you tell you you know better. He's a guru. That's all. And talk to us about spiritual matters like they all do. I went to an Osho retreat in Rishikesh, India. Ah. Uh, not a retreat. It was a, it was a workshop. Tell us. Um, it was one of the dancing meditations. You do that? No. <laughs> you basically, you like dance for like 10 minutes. And then like you do all these weird dancings and yellings and stuff. And stuff goes down his retreats. Like there's like, it's very intense forms of meditation. Like moving your body, orgies, all that kind of stuff. Uh, this was did not you bad. have did you have an orgy? No, this was just <laughs> did not have an orgy in the class. Uh, it was basically we were just sort of dancing to music, yeah. and then um, for like fifteen minutes and jumping and dancing and jumping and screaming, and then we sat still and meditated. So we exhausted the body, and then we were able to go more inward into the mind. Um, Sounds fun though. Yeah. To dance. Did you? So this was Deepak Chopra. Osho was there as well. Who did? Now all he came these, and spoke. Out of all these people you met, who do you feel like was the most prominent on your life? Like who left the biggest mark? Was it Ram Das? Ram Das. Ram Das. Ram Das. Yeah, I saw him many times when he came around to do his uh, presentations to audiences here and mm. there. Whenever he came by L.A., I went to see him, and uh, I went up to him once, and this was years after I knew him in Massachusetts. 
And I said, oh. Dick from Newton, I know you. <laughs> and he smiled and he remembered me. And he said, thank you for reminding me of who I really am. <laughs> you know why that's funny, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> wow. Have you ever done a meditation retreat, Amanda? No. Would you be open to it? Yeah, definitely. Especially now. It feels like we we have been more like talking more about spirituality and also about drugs <laughs> um and it just it scares me a little bit but i'm definitely open for it that's healthy that's healthy. anything that grows from the earth in the drug category i'm interested in like the uh the san pedro plant the peyote any of those things that is naturally being provided by the earth is interesting for me to try hmm. Like and I, and I, the Indonesian herb. And kratom. Yeah. That's very big in America now. Never tried it though. What is it? Kratom? K-R-A-T-O-M. Pronounced kratom. And is it? <laughs> oh, <laughs> there, yeah. Kratom. The thing I don't like about how it's being rolled out in the United States is it's being lumped together with tobacco products, smoke shops, bongs, and it's almost like it's branding it in a way where people don't view it in a medicinal herbal way. But they use it as an herb in Asia and other places. Huh. Like it has a lot of. Uh, it helps with depression. It helps with fatigue. Really? Yeah, it, it gives people energy. But the way it's branded here is almost like how marijuana was branded years ago, where it's like this is a bad drug. I, kratom is a uh, does have dependency qualities to it. It's not. I don't recommend anyone gets hooked on anything. But if you have addictive genes, if you have, anything is apt to get you addicted to it. Exactly. But you walk into a smoke shop and it's you kind of just see paraphernalia everywhere. And then it's like, oh, Kratom. And in your mind, it's like, it, I feel like it cheapens the effects that it, it can have for someone. If someone has chronic pain, for example, there's certain sh- strains of the Kratom that can help your pain. Not not dissimilar from CBD or something. But exactly. I think. But I think it's being kratom's being repressed because it's a uh, challenging big some of big pharma's products, and that's why they're making it illegal. And it's it's not getting, for my opinion, it should be sold in like wellness stores with other herbs and type of plant hmm. medicines. But it's not so far. Do you feel like you know being alive in that time, in the seventies and the eighties, and like this movement of love and freedom and was well, the most fun I ever had. <laughs> Do you feel like, um, you know, because then I feel like the 80s came and then things closed off and we got very Well, then there was AIDS and we had to stop having orgies. <laughs> Is that right? why? Yeah. Uh, but they were using condoms back then, weren't they? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like using condoms? I mean, it's the alternative is worse. Uh, yeah, I'm okay with them. Oh. <laughs> do, do, you, do you think um, we'll have another period like that like the 60s mm. and 70s summer of love do you think that's coming back or i no? think we'll have that in 2030 2040 not unless we get rid of all disease you think that's the biggest thing or do you think the internet in a way and technology going crazy in a way has connected all of us in one way but also disconnected everyone from the heart center in other ways you know i was just thinking about that earlier today how we're all more connected than we ever ever were before and at the same time we were all at a distance. Exactly. Mm. It's really a phenomenon. It's interesting. It's weird because like... A dichotomy. Yeah, it, especially with things like Instagram and Facebook, you're constantly being reminded of people's lives, what they're doing on the daily. Like, oh, I just went here. I just ate this for breakfast. I'm doing this. You wouldn't do that normally in life. You'd maybe call a friend and catch, do a catch up once a week, but they're not going to be like, I ate avocado toast for lunch yesterday. And like, <laughs> I met this person and, and like... We're getting so much information about people we know, and it creates a sense of envy and jealousy because you feel like they're doing so much more than you are, and then you feel like, well, I need to be doing more. But it's all an illusion. Like it's, it's. It, I feel like it. It creates a sense like yes, we're more connected, but we're also not as close. We're very, everyone has a lot of like quick friends, you know, like oh let's hang out or let's do this, but you're not. You don't have like the deep sense because you have so many people. I feel like it creates a sense of disconnection. In a sense, I well, I, I um, am talking to people on Facebook particularly, and a little bit on Instagram too. People that I haven't talked to since forty or fifty years ago that I was mm. once very close with. 
So it has it has the pluses. I mean, we all do that, oh, right? That that to me is everything. Yeah, it's and you have everything. the memory feature when that pops up. I think you know, it's from about ten years yeah, ago. I think it's about using social media as a tool to eventually take it beyond the computer or phone screen and connect more and restore a human to human connection. Whereas a lot of people live lives solely just through social media, hundred percent, or solely th- even through text. People 100%. that will not pick up their phone, they just want to text. Yeah, they just want to have that more closed off experience a hundred percent i mean it's it's been so useful for me because i when i lived abroad and i was i was living abroad for about five years and when i go to a country i joined facebook and there would always be an expat group like real expats of bollywood or expats of hanoi or expats of south korea and then within that there'd be like smaller groups wherever the town you were in so you could join that group and people would meet up and they would have um, you know, like it'd be a way to connect with other people. And then because of things like Facebook and Instagram, you're also keeping in touch with everyone. So you have like, you know, you go traveling and you're like, Hey, I'm going to be in Germany. Anyone, any friends in Germany? And then like, you know, you know, John happens to be in Germany that time. And you end up meeting up with John and you're both in Germany at the same time. And those sort of like funny incidents. So it definitely has its, its, uh, perks, but yeah, I think the, the danger is the addiction, like with anything. And it's also, depending on when you were born, your relationship to it, our relationship to it, we're somewhat familiar with it, but we didn't get it until, what, 16, 17? Maybe you got it at, what, 13, 14? Yeah, Barbara I didn't get it till her 60s, and there's kids now that are growing up. I was in my 20s during the 60s and 30s during no, the 70s. In, no, in your 60s. No. No. Facebook hasn't been around for 20 years. <laughs> internet just, well i i mean internet like the internet's 90s. really only uh, no since 90s yeah like since um, the 90s my, she's been my, using my then husband brought a computer home in 1995 and parked it in the living room and i felt i sat down at the computer and i felt like an entity had come to live <laughs> with us and i better befriend it because this thing <laughs> was connecting me to more than the more, more than this planet the entire universe. That's mm. how it. That I felt that strongly, and I didn't really know too much about it. I had been forced to use it during several uh, classes, uh, uh, during my master's degrees and my doctorate degrees in um, uh, well, degrees in education and degrees in psychology, mm-hmm. but for things that I would never use again. Uh, and and the first computer that I ever sat at went up to the ceiling. <laughs> wow. And I was supposed to feed it this formula, and it was going to give me an answer. And I couldn't move. I was terrified. I had a stomach ache from fear. I was so afraid of it. I went home and got my then-husband. It's a different then-husband than the other then-husband. <laughs> <laughs> and I made him come in with me to the lab where it was, and he sat next to me. And then I wasn't afraid anymore. Because he had learned how to do that in the Navy. Mm. He was a radar man and he learned how to deal with It's so crazy how how big computers used to be. Like you said the computer was up to, touched, the, ceiling. Up to the ceiling. And when I fed it this formula and it spit out the answer, I felt like there were 4,000 little guys in there running around figuring out the answer. And they did it very fast and came up with it. And that's how I saw it. I had to make it rational. Can you imagine like the, that moment, like one day the technology will get so advanced that people can send pictures of their brunch to each other? <laughs> <laughs> what did you imagine technology would look like when you were a kid or in your 20s? I you- never imagined technology, period. You didn't think like flying cars or anything like no. that? No. I saw the Jetsons and all that, but it didn't interest me. It looked like fantasy, you know, like cartoons. Yeah, it's fantasy until it becomes reality, I guess. Right. And then your well, brain I just adapts. I understand that they're doing that now. Cars are flying around. Yeah. Yeah. I think they're, think they're called planes. I'm not yeah. sure. <laughs> Probably. Planes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's. I feel like we, we're so used to technology, but the iPhone, which was the first smartphone, like, you know, those capabilities came out in 2004. It's not even 20 years ago. Yeah, that's insane. I I got my first um, cell phone in 93. First, I had a beeper. Mm. And uh, and then I got an iPhone. It was one of those flip phones. Right, right. And I loved it. (laughs) And I had it for 25 years. And I wouldn't let go of it. And I wouldn't get anything else. 
And then my grandson died and I had to go to Canada and it didn't have international capabilities. So I was told I had to either rent a phone or buy a phone. So I bought it. And I'm in happened. love with it as if it was a person. Mm. Oh, yeah. I mean, it kind of gives you everything you need. It does. Kind of. Everything? Not, maybe not every. I don't. <laughs> everything I need. Yeah, kind of. That's it's a good thing. but It's also scary because we're all like we know where our phones are. We need to check our phones. If we don't have our phones for just a little bit. Can you remember a time when we didn't have our phones on? We didn't have phones on us for seven, 17 years. We didn't never had that. Now it's like, where's my phone? Yeah. Where's my phone? And now you really can't even participate in society or business or socializing without one. You really can't. Yeah, I mean, I thought about it today when I was out on my morning walk and I was going to buy coffee. I always buy it through my phone because, you know, you can double click, do something and, and your card pops up and you can pay with your phone. So I don't have anything with me except my phone and my keys to How? my house, which probably can be. I mean, in a couple of years, we can Somebody probably unlock. Car, yeah, you can probably phone. unlock your car How? in your house with your, your phone. You already can. I mean. No, now you can unlock your little. If you have like some smart locks. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. And you can do the lights with Alexa from your phone. You do all of that. Somebody came to visit me today and I wasn't home and I beeped him in anyway. Yeah. <laughs> How did people like in the seventies and eighties? How did they have orgies without phones? Well, what do you need a phone <laughs> for in the middle of an orgy? <laughs> to meet up. Well, you mean how did they organize? How did they organize it? Oh, you had orgies with your friends. Oh. And your friends introduced you to their friends, and yeah. one of my friends opened a club. An orgy club. Yeah, specifically for doing things. They called the grass is always greener. <laughs> <laughs> and Shouldn't it be called one in the hand, two in the bush? Better name. Invited my husband and I to come and check it out, and so we went. And um, he was a very beautiful man, and everybody wanted him. And this was more of the same. We did that all the time. Didn't have to go to a club to get that. Yeah. So we didn't <laughs> leave with anybody because I didn't want to. Mm. Such a different time. No. I feel like I was watching this documentary on Studio Fifty Four. When that was fascinating um, with, um, and then there was a show. What was the show with Ewan McGregor? What was that? Oh, we, wa we watched that. Halston. Just that time period. is it crazy. That was good. Yeah. I saw that. I yeah. keep thinking about the girl that got stuck in the vent and she's like, trying that's a real story. That's terrifying. The what? woman who remember <laughs> she tried to sneak into Studio Fifty Four and she, and she got oh, climbed yeah, through yeah. the vents and then got stuck and then did she die in the she vent or She died. Fall? They well, found those her. things happen all the time. People try to break into things and. They die in the chimney and they die in the elevator shaft. You hear about that all the time. <laughs> Happened to Santa a few times in my house. <laughs> <laughs> Amanda, what, um, I guess you, I mean, you weren't alive, but was there a sort of <laughs> like. How old are you? Way to throw under the bus. I'm 27. <laughs> What's the 70s movement? Better be careful. That's the year. That's the year of the what? Year. The year of Saturn tra tra transversing your. All your signs, and that's why all the stars die, the rock stars and everything. That's why everybody dies. Yeah. It's oh, right. I was so scared. I, yes, I remember that. I was like, you what is 28, but now it's 27. So I'm turning 28 in December. So I always thought we'll I that's next month. I know. Oh my God. What did you do for your birthday? I don't know. I'm going to India with you guys. Oh. <laughs> if you yeah. get that part. If I get that part, we'll all go to India. Yeah. I I'm not going. Okay. If you flew private, would you go? What? If you flew private, would you go? I I don't know. I, they have they have too much COVID there. Remember? That's true. They do. Oh, that's right, a that's that is a problem. Yeah, it is a problem. Yes, yeah, so I don't know what to do on my birthday. So that's big, big twenty eight. What's the date? Eighteenth of December. Did it, you were around last year, weren't you? Was I around? Did we do something? No, we didn't do something. I called you on my birthday, and then I I said I remember this. And I said, Brian, tell me happy birthday. And then you said, why? <laughs> and then I said, because it's my birthday. And then you said, oh, is your birthday today? And I was like, yes. And then you said, oh, happy birthday. <laughs> what a beautiful, <laughs> beautiful have to do something. <laughs> <laughs> tell it me happy birthday. Oh, wait, wow. in my defense, you didn't tell me it was your birthday. No. You didn't tell anyone that your birthday. I had no idea. So I was I like, know. why would I tell you happy birthday? I thought I it's know. like you won something or something, you know. If you're not going to be on a plane to India, we'll have to do something to celebrate. Yes. For her birthday. Yeah. Yes. We what, all what can What should celebrate. we do? When uh, you leave. LSD? No. no I, yeah. I, <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I can do that. Yeah. 
I don't know what I we have no desire to do any more of that. We could meditate. I feel it's I've done it to to the nth degree. Mm. It's been done. The best thing is just having calm. You know, I think she feels much more. Looks calm. calm. The stuff you get at Costco. Uh, <laughs> it's this thing I've heard some people have experienced. I personally haven't. And I think <laughs> when you have that sense of calm and peace that she has, you don't need to. It's the highest happiness. It, yeah, mm. it's the most sustainable. It just flows. You don't I've have never to, done LSD. At you some don't point, have to. When the moment's right, I'll do it. Well, oh, you did psilocybin. It's the, the same thing. Uh, okay. Very similar. Yeah. yeah, It's the same thing. Remember that tea to. I gave you before we started the podcast? Steven, why do you have two heads? Is everything sounding okay to you, Brian? <laughs> Barbara, what is your advice being a woman who's lived multiple lifetimes, it seems? What's your advice to... The younger generation that's just starting this thing called life v- your views on things try not to blame your parents <laughs> <laughs> try not to blame them for the state of the world it just is what it is it devolved into what it is and i like to believe what marianne williamson says that it's the just the beginning of a new better beginning we're going to be and Eckhart Tolle says the same thing, and so does Deepak Chopra. We had to go through this down, dark period where there's violence and killing and all that to come to a better place where there'll never be that again. Mm. I, I'm, a, I'm a believer in positivity. I believe we are going through a dip, but, but just to clear out all of this negative energy. Yeah. Because I think yeah. our natural state is to be high up there. And I agree. Love, but we've just Certainly lost our ways. Better. Lost our ways for quite a while, I think. And it's been getting worse. Yeah, it's getting worse before it gets better. And commercialism has something to do with it, and uh, the disparity in incomes has a lot to do with it mm. too. Barbara, where can people find you on social media to see some of your acting work? Do you want to? Well, I have a, my own special, separate page on Facebook. You know how some people do with just certain things from my acting career from my commercial career that you can view great we'll put that in the from the description i'm gonna do it right now at (laughs) at dr barbara rubin that's barbara with one no no it's it's just (laughs) it doesn't have the second oh it's it's barbara with two a's not three it's not barbara it's barbara right yeah all right and i'm also on instagram and if you need therapy she She's still in, still, well, in, still in the business for well, certain clients. Well, I do clients. Reiki and I do EMDR and I do life coaching a little, just a little. Amazing. We can all use that. Guys. Yes, definitely. It's been three people on a couch. Dr. Barbara Rubin, thank you for being here. And thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Good night. Is this, is this a Mandela thing? Do you no. know what the ring is? Yes. Yeah. And do you know what the grudge is? I just destroy the couch. Okay. So, <laughs> so I've heard of both films. I just they don't both know. do exist, right? This is not going to be one of the. <laughs> <You're in. laughs> She's becoming the couch. Here in America, I'm more like. I, I have need to, to walk. Yeah, yep. I have to go for a walk. But in in Sweden, it was like I walk to work, I walk to the food store. Right. I, I didn't even have a car. Even in our gyms here, there's not treadmills anymore. There's Ubers. <laughs> <laughs> People just won't walk.